Cantos 2 through 4 is where the Inferno part of the Divine Comedy officially begins. The day was waning, and the darkening sky called all the creatures of the earth to rest after the long day's labors. Only I was preparing all alone to endure the test of the journey and the pity of what I would see, as unerring memory will now attest. Muses, high genius aid me. Memory that recorded what I saw among the dead. Here you will show your true integrity. Dante opens his actual discussion of the Inferno with a plea to the muses, and particularly to memory, to aid him in his telling. This is a very traditional form of poetry called the epic poem. Other epic poems that you're familiar with, such as the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, all begin with a plea to the muses to aid the poet in telling the story. We can see the same technique at the beginning of Purgatorio and at the beginning of Paradiso. Each time he starts a section, he is going to call to the muses to help him and telling the story. In doing so, he's placing his poem in the same category with the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, these great epic poems, these great epic journeys. And that's going to become important in just a second, as we're going to see. But also, we talked about this the idea of the text as an encyclopedia. Here he is talking about every aspect of humanity. He's also going to attempt to explore every aspect of poetry and look at all the different ways that a poem can be poetic. He's going to delve into epic. He's going to delve into comic. He's going to delve into tragic. He's going to delve into satiric. All of these different forms of poetry are going to show up in his work. The scope of what he's trying to do is pretty enormous. We also mentioned the distinction earlier between Dante the Traveler and Dante the Poet. Here, Dante the Poet is calling upon memory, trying to do something great in composing this poem. But Dante the Traveler is wallowing in self-doubt. Before he even begins, he's losing his nerve. O oh, poet, you who are my guide, I said, weigh whether I am fit for what lies in wait before you entrust me to the path ahead. He's concerned that he's not going to make it, and he compares himself to two important people, Aeneas and Paul. They serve as parallels in his journey through the inferno, purgatory, and heaven. Aeneas is famous in the story of the Aeneid for having descended into the underworld in order to talk to the spirits down there and to guide him to his new home. Paul is famous for having undergone a vision that brought him up to the highest heaven. Both these great men, Aeneas, a great hero of mythology that Virgil wrote about, and Paul, a great hero of Christianity, they both are in some way much better than Dante. And Dante, as a person, doesn't feel like he's worthy of this journey. The truth is, he's not. But the good thing is, it's not his own will that's supposed to get him through this journey. There's something else empowering him. But why must I? On whose authority? I am not Aeneas, not Paul. Why should I seek what neither I nor anyone thinks me worthy to do? Why start upon a bleak end? I fear foolish journey. You are filled with wisdom and hear more clearly than I speak. Here he describes himself and the idea of his will. Remember, will is incredibly important to the Inferno. Will will get you in and place you where you are in the Inferno. Those who have stronger will towards evil will be the deepest and darkest sinners. Those who have a stronger will towards good should have more chance of overcoming. But here, Dante has no will at all. Like someone who unwills what he has willed and with new thoughts sees his resolve go by, letting what was begun go unfulfilled, so standing on that shadowy slope was I. He describes himself unwilling what he willed. So for about two seconds, he had enough gumption to get up and start going on this quest, and then immediately he undoes that will. To begin with, Dante the Traveler is pretty wishy-washy. He's pretty weak. He started out going astray because of neglect, because he wasn't paying attention, because his will was not in the right place. And he nearly goes wrong again by not having his will determined in the right place. But Virgil has another idea. To free you from this fear, let me explain why I have come and tell you of the request that first made me take pity on your pain. I was among the suspended ones when a blessed and lovely lady called me. So fair was she, I begged that I might serve at her behest. Brighter than stars, her eyes shone brilliantly. So Beatrice has descended down into the limbo to call up Virgil. And she says to him, go now and with the words of your high art and the skill to rescue him from this distress, assist him and bring solace to my heart. So she sends his skill, his poetic skill, to help Dante on his journey. So Dante is backed not only by poetry, but also by 
divine love. Listen to the next bit. I who send you forth am Beatrice. I have come from a place I long to see again. Love prompted me. Love makes me do this. Okay, so Beatrice, who represents divine love, has descended down to send Virgil to rescue Dante. Ultimately, she's going to be with Dante in his final journey through heaven. So Dante has to realize that it's not just his will that gets him through. Will is important, but poetry helps him, and also divine love. Ultimately, divine love is the thing that's going to get him through this. Virgil goes on to describe other ladies who have helped in this process. There was the Virgin Mary, who sent Lucia to Beatrice to let her know that Dante was in trouble, and then Beatrice, who descends down and calls on Virgil to save Dante. Virgil concludes the story of his being called by Beatrice by saying to Dante, what is this then? Why, why do you delay? Why does your heart make room for cowardice? Why not be bold and resolute when they, those three great ladies of high blessedness in heaven's court, are keeping you in sight when I promise you great good to come of this? In other words, Dante, you've got divine love on your side. I've already promised you that it's gonna work out. So what are you doing? Pull yourself together and get through this. Dante concludes saying, lead on. There is one will between us two. You are my guide, my lord and master. Thus I spoke. And when he moved, I entered to the pathway through the savage wilderness. Notice again the comment on will. Dante now finds a new will, not in himself, but in those who have called him. There is one will between us two. He makes his own will into Virgil's. Canto three begins with the description over the door. Through me the way to the city of desolation. Through me the way to everlasting pain. Through me the way to souls and abomination. Justice, move my great maker in my design. I was created by the primal love. Wisdom supreme and potency divine. Before me nothing was created, save the eternal and I endure eternally. All you who enter, let no hope survive. The last line is particularly famous. We usually remember it as, Abandon hope, all you who enter here. And this is the line that Dante really listens to and hears when he sees this sign above the door. Because the first thing Dante's going to do with his newfound will in Virgil is look up at the door and go, Ah! Again, he's still a colossal wimp. But when he looks at that sign, he sees, Those who come in here have no hope. And he thinks, wait a second, I'm going in there. I don't want to lose all hope. Virgil has to quickly explain to him that this sign actually doesn't apply to him because he's sort of the exception to the rule. He's just here visiting, he's on tour. But there's a few other things that are interesting about this sign that Dante sort of ignores. The first three lines talk about the way to desolation, everlasting pain, and abomination. It's pretty harsh. But the second three lines are unique and interesting. They say, justice moved my great maker in my design. I was created by the primal love, wisdom supreme, and potency divine. Those of us who are thinking about the idea of hell, thinking about the entrance into hell, don't usually think of love. We might think of justice. We might think of wisdom. But love? The idea that love creates hell is a little strange. But as we go through hell, we begin to understand that the people who are in hell are really there because they want to be there. Well, they may not think they want to be there, but they chose to be there, and they continue to choose to be there. In fact, everyone who's in hell is not going to accept any other option for their own lives. They deny that they're responsible for their being in hell, and they just continue to push the blame somewhere else. Not only that, but they continue doing the same things that have caused them to be here in the first place. They can't let go of their bad behavior, of their fallenness. And because of that gripping on to the bad lifestyles that they previously led, they can't go anywhere else. Once Dante has come to terms with the message of the door, it's time to go inside. So his first impression of what's going on in hell is pretty much what you'd expect. He hears horrifying cries and is overcome with terror. Sighs and laments and loud wails filled my ears. Those cries resounding through the starless air so moved me at first that I burst into tears. The babble of tongues, harsh outcries of despair, noises of rage and grief, the beating of hands and shrill and raucous voices everywhere all made a mad uproar that never ends, revolving in that timeless darkened breeze the way a whirlwind whips the desert sands. And so he bursts into tears. That's fairly important. We're going to notice that he either cries or faints multiple times throughout the inferno, based upon what happens in front of him. And every time he does, there's a good reason. 
The first one is just his initial impression of hell. It's so overwhelming and so overcoming that it seems to cause him to grieve intensely. Perhaps this could be because he is realizing he himself has gone astray and this could be his fate. Later on when we see him faint or cry, it's going to be for very specific reasons, and we'll have to pay close attention. The first bunch of sinners they run into actually aren't in hell exactly. They're in the vestibule, or the foyer of hell. They're running around being chased by wasps and being bitten by worms. And Virgil reveals that these souls are the ones who did not choose a side. They neither chose good or evil. They just sort of sat back to watch what would happen. Basically, they're really wishy-washy. They think they'll just sort of wait out the war and see who wins and then jump in on that side. And because of this wishy-washiness, because they neither chose good nor evil, they do not have a place. Heaven won't accept them because they weren't good, and hell won't accept them because they weren't evil. They're just blasé. And notice what else happens to them. Looking again, I saw a banner race whirling about so madly that it seems unfit to make a stand in one fixed place. Following it, a line of people streamed, an endless line as far as I could see, that death had undone so many I had not dreamed. So they're forced to chase after this blank banner. Chase a flag that has nothing on it, that's going around and around and around. Because they never chose a side in life, they're constantly chasing after nothing. This is the first example of a really important concept in the Inferno. Contrapasso. Contrapasso is the idea that the punishment fits the crime, that whatever you did wrong, your punishment is going to be extremely appropriate. It's the same idea as poetic justice. So here, their punishment is a continuance of what they've always been doing in life. They never chose a side, and so they have no side in the afterlife. They never chose a banner to run under, and so they run under a blank banner that never stays still. We'll see as we go throughout the Inferno, this idea of contrapasso is consistent. Every soul is really just continuing his or her own sin, and that continuance of a sin is a punishment in and of itself. If they would ever let it go, they could go to purgatory, but they can't. They're just stuck doing the same action over and over and over again, and that's their hell. The idea of contrapasso in purgatory is very different from the idea of contrapasso in Inferno. Once Dante gets up into purgatory, he's going to see that the souls are still being punished for their sin, but instead of being punished by continuing the sin over and over again, they're punished in an opposite way that will cleanse them of their sins. So for instance, the prideful, who you'd normally expect them to have their chin in the air and their head held high, are forced to stand under a rock that pushes their heads down. A corrective action that undoes the action of pride. Also interesting to note, in this band of people who didn't choose a side, who didn't take responsibility for their actions and didn't select good or evil, is one shade whose cowardice made him make the great refusal. Hard to say exactly who this is, but it might be Celestine V, the Pope, who abdicated his role and allowed the evil Boniface VIII to take over. This is pretty fascinating because this is the last time in history that a pope has abdicated until 2013. Dante felt that a pope who gave up his role and allowed someone else to come in was not doing his job in the church. And later on, the next couple of popes who come along are gonna be rotten guys. So Dante continues his journey down and comes to the Acheron, the river he must cross in order to continue in the Inferno. Now those of you who like mythology might find this a little bit odd because normally when you come to the underworld, the first river you come to is the Styx and you have to cross the Styx in order to enter the underworld. And who ferries you across? Charon. Well, Charon's also here ferrying people across the Acheron, but the river is different. Why does Dante pick another river? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. Styx is represented of oath. The gods always choose the river Styx when they swear something, because once they swear by the river Styx, they can't break their oath. But Acheron, on the other hand, is the river of woe. It represents woe and sorrow and grief. And it's a pretty appropriate river for the beginning of the Inferno. We're going to see all the rivers as we go through the Inferno, except for one, which is up on Purgatory. And each of the rivers represent something significant. Dante is going to use their symbolic resonance to emphasize his own ideas. Now, something odd here. Why is Charon and these Greek mythological rivers in Christian hell? Well, we're going to see that there's actually many, many mythological figures down here in hell. 
Why? Well, Dante's doing something kind of interesting here. He's not just trying to literally talk about hell, but he's also trying to talk about the symbolism behind it all. He's trying to emphasize key ideas that he wants you to get. In order to do that, he's going to use allegory. There are two kinds of allegory that Dante talks about in his other writing. The first is poetic allegory. Poetic allegory uses stories from poetry, from art, all of these symbolic stories. And these stories are not literal. No one really believes in them. For instance, the story of Orpheus from mythology. In the story of Orpheus, it's said that Orpheus's beautiful music causes the rocks and the trees to actually animate and follow him in order to listen to him. Really, this was very unrealistic. No one actually believed that rocks and trees began to move in order to listen to beautiful music. But it was a nice story. It shows how music can move us, how music can stir us even when we don't feel like it. On the other hand, there's theological allegory. Theological allegory is a story which shows some kind of meaning, but also is considered by its audience to be accurate and true. So when Dante talks about historical, physical characters who show up in hell, and he uses them to symbolize something important about politics or about his life, that's theological allegory. Now, we'll see as we go through this idea of poetical allegory. He's going to show all kinds of things from mythology which he doesn't believe in. As we go through the Inferno, we're going to see all these different mythological figures that Dante is using to represent something that his audience knows about. His audience is familiar with these mythological figures and they know the stories attributed to them. They also understand what each of these figures seems to be connected with. And when they see this mythological figure, they associate it with certain ideas. Dante will use the associations his audience already has with these characters from mythology in order to emphasize his point. So when you see mythological figures, mythological features in the Inferno, he's trying to connect something to something you already associate. Symbolism! Now Charon and the Atron mark the entrance into the Inferno. Charon is terrifying. Dante is very scared when he sees him. It calls Charon a demon, saying his eyes were aglow like live coals. And at first, Charon threatens Dante and tells him he cannot come here because he's still alive. But Virgil says, Charon, no need to roar. Thus it is willed where there is power to do what has been willed, so question it no more. Throughout the Book of the Inferno, Virgil is going to help Dante get past certain obstacles. Just as we mentioned earlier, Virgil, who represents poetry, helps him through. But it's not just Virgil's role as a poet or as poetry. It's also because he has the divine right to go on this journey. He's been given permission by heaven, and he's going to keep using that argument every time he faces an obstacle. At the close of this particular canto, Dante faints for the first time. He falls down lifeless. Up from the tear-soaked ground, a great wind ran, flashing a bright red light all out of its swell, blasted all my senses like a man that sleep is overtaken. Down I fell. Again, we see Dante completely overcome by the horror of this moment. He's entered into hell and it's overwhelming him. If it weren't for Virgil and for his divine support, he would never make it through all of this. But he's going to be carried through it all and it's gonna be okay. Incidentally, a hint on the video game that I made for you all. Once you get to the Acheron, the only way to get across it is to faint. Canto 4 opens with Dante awakening again. And as he awakes, he's looking down into the pit of the Inferno. And it begins to describe the Inferno for the first time actually. It's a giant funnel that goes down, 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 down to the very center of the world. And as you go down the funnel, around the funnel are rings. Nine rings, actually. And each ring represents a level for different kinds of sinners. Something interesting happens as they look down into the pit. Line 13. Now let us descend into the blind world below, the poet said, appearing pale and drawn. I will be first, you second as we go. Seeing his pallor, I said, I lean upon your strength when I falter, when I am afraid. If you are frightened, how shall I go on? All right, so Dante sees that Virgil appears pale, looking down into the pit. And Dante, seeing Virgil's paleness, realizes that this is a terrible, dangerous place to be. And if Virgil is scared, there's no way he's getting out of here alive. Virgil goes on to admit that it's his pity for all of these souls down here in hell that causes him to turn pale, and not his fear. 
but it is an indication that poetry is not strong enough to get us through everything. Now, I don't know about you, but I love a good poem to help encourage me at a moment of fear or discomfort. Or maybe when I feel happy, I like to read some poetry to strengthen my mood. Poetry can influence our emotions and can help carry us through emotionally difficult times. And if you don't like poetry, I understand, I suppose, another sort of thing that's similar is music. How many of you listen to music when you feel emotionally down or emotionally up? Music can comfort us, poetry can comfort us. That's kind of the idea that Dante's getting at when he talks about Virgil being a comfort and a guide to him throughout this place. But even if music or poetry or art can comfort us, it still isn't enough to save us. And that's going to be important as we go through. Okay, and finally we enter into the first actual circle of hell. And the first circle of hell is different from the rest of hell. It's called Limbo, and it's not for punishing souls who were evil, but rather it's a place of stasis for souls who haven't done anything wrong but aren't part of Christianity. Their only fault is failing to understand Christianity. This includes unbaptized babies, people who live good lives but were outside of the Christian era, and it also includes Virgil himself. This is where Virgil stays when he's not guiding Dante through the Inferno. I heard no wails of lamentation there, no loud complaints, only the sound of sighs that agitated the eternal air. From a sadness without torments rose the cries of children and of women and of men. Many and vast were the crowds before my eyes. So they're not being punished, and their only real grief here is that they can never attain heaven. But otherwise, it's not such a bad place. It's mostly rather pleasant, and really, all the jerks are further on down below. They get to spend all of their time with great intellectual minds and generally good people. There are lots of great people down here, lots of philosophers and scientists and mathematicians and poets and all kinds of people. The setting, as we see on page 16, um, let me read you a passage. We came to where a noble castle stood, circled by seven high walls. All around that citadel a lovely streamlet flowed. We crossed the stream as though on solid ground. Through seven gates those sages passed with me. We came up to a fresh green meadow, where we found people with looks of great authority, whose eyes moved slowly and were serious, who spoke in quiet tones and frequently. Then we moved off to one side, where there was a luminous broad hillside that would yield a view of the whole gathering to us. Before me on that green enameled field, such glorious spirits appeared that still I prize within my soul the sights that were revealed. We see a castle here, uh, a green meadow, a broad field, a stream, a hillside, a whole lot of natural garden imagery. Um, this location is a place of peace, peacefulness. Um, it's a garden of sorts. And we see here in this sense of the, the idea of the garden, um, the garden becomes a place where Dante can rest and let down his guard. In the previous canto, he was filled with terror and uh, the horror of entering into hell, but now the place is relaxed and pleasant, and he sees lots of people that he's always been interested in. However, we notice that there a threat creeps up in the midst of his relaxation, in the midst of him letting down his guard. With Virgil, he comes in contact with some of the greatest poets of all time. Uh, we see on page 16 it says, I saw four noble shades all moving forward, their faces neither glad nor sorrowful. Said my master, See the one who bears the sword, and one who walks before the other three, acknowledged as their leader and their lord. Homer, the sovereign of all bards, is he. Horace the satirist is the second one. Ovid comes third. And Lucan, finally. Because along with me they all have won the name by which I was just now addressed. They do me honor, and it is well done. The name he's referring to here is Hails the Highest Poet. They call him the highest poet when they greet him. So here are the five great, greatest poets of all time, and Dante is getting the honor of meeting them. He continues and says, Assembled there before me were the best of poets, the school of that sweet lord of style, who, like an eagle, soars above the rest. When they had talked together for a while, they turned to me with a nod of salutation, at which I saw my master broadly smile. And then they made a far greater demonstration of honor, bringing me up to their height, making me sixth in their wisdom's congregation. He talks about them doing him an honor, but at the same time, he is including himself in among the greatest poets of all time, saying, hey, yeah, uh, you know, Homer, Virgil, all of them, I'm up there with them. 
Virgil has just said that they all have this title of highest poet, and so he's sort of associating himself here and uh, and and calling himself to some extent the highest poet. Hey, I'm as good as Ovid. I'm as good as Lucan. I'm as good as Homer. This pride that Dante is feeling uh, as he's letting down his guard in this garden um, is definitely a danger. It's a pride in his own poetry. We've already emphasized the importance of the role of poetry in this story, and we're going to continue emphasizing it. But we see here that Dante is in a bit of danger due to his pride. Which Dante is this? We talked about two different Dantes last time. Well, it's Dante the poet. Dante the poet is elevating himself to the level of these other poets. Funny how he suddenly becomes so consumed with his own poetry and with the power of his poetry, when at the very beginning of this canto we've already seen uh, a sort of a shaky stance of poetry or a uh, the instability of poetry in providing you a, a guidance in hell. Virgil was, was upset, Virgil was looking pale and drawn, and so we see that poetry, again, is not as powerful as, uh, as it, we make it out to be at, at times. And here Dante is in overweening pride over po his poetry. At the end of the canto, they continue on and descend towards the second circle, where we will actually see the suffering of the prisoners of hell. Special thanks to my son Henry uh, in this episode who provided the uh, singing of the theme song. Brought to you by the letter H and the number zero. H is for heaven where Beatrice waits. She's sent to save Dante and show him these gates. Zero's the one we forget because it's small. It stands for the neutrals who don't count at all. <laughs>